Now, I know these. Uh, this is part three of our membership, uh, exploring membership. And I know that this is such a slender little piece. In part one, we talked about Scripture, the Word of God. And I've encouraged you to read the Scripture. The earliest church, that's what they did. They had reading groups to simply read it. In part two, we looked at the nature of God. And we talked about the different metaphors of God that are used. For instance, God is the creator. God is the judge. God is the king. Uh, but we looked at God's how God is a father. And not just any father, but the father of this particular son, Jesus Christ. And so the full revelation of, G, of God in Jesus Christ comes as the revelation of the son of this father. And so we looked at those, uh, at those, um, those key components. This is what it means to be a Christian, right? And so, so far, we've looked at these kinds of things. And now we look at two passages I'd like to point out. And that is from Galatians 4, 6 and Romans 8, 17, as places where this is remembered by Paul and preserved for us. That is the story about Jesus. So first Galatians, uh, Galatians 4, 6. Galatians 4, 6. Because you are children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a child, and if a child, then also an heir through God. And so this is uh, Romans eight, fifteen through 17 also, where Paul remembers. And this basically is the story of Jesus, how Jesus becomes an, an images for us, his sonship to God the Father. And so we look at John 3, that Jesus has been sent by God the Father, and we, we draw that out and we talk about Jesus' pre-existence. That is, before Jesus was incarnate, that is, before Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary, before he lived and served and ministered and performed miracles and taught and then was crucified and then raised from the dead, before Jesus is incarnate, literally in the flesh meant Jesus existed with God as the Son even before he arrived. We look at Jesus' birth in Luke and Matthew 1 and Luke 2. In Matthew 1, that's the, the big genealogy and uh, followed by um, the, the Magi who arrive to pay homage to Jesus. In Luke 2, we have a different sort of birth story, but it it comes close, at least in some respects, to the one that Matthew tells. In Luke 2, we get the uh, the little bit about Quirinius and, and the, the historical situation, which, unfortunately, if you press those details, you realize not quite accurate, but as accurate as Luke is going to get them. Following the birth story, you have the story of Jesus' life and ministry, miracles and teaching. The first thing that Jesus teaches in Mark chapter 1, repent for the kingdom of God has come near. And repentance there doesn't necessarily mean repentance from sin. It means repentance from being the kind of nationalistic um, uh, arm that the Jews had been. And Jesus is inviting them to be the kingdom of God in a very, very different way. And the only word that Jesus can use to describe the difference is to say you have to repent from being the kingdom in the way that they're, they're being it to the kingdom that Jesus will show. And what does Jesus' kingdom look like? The kingdom of God looks like the disadvantaged, the sick, the, those who are uh, plagued by demons, who God comes and delivers and heals and forgives. These people who were misfits in just about every way, those are the ones Jesus picks. He uses strange things too. He doesn't come with a kingdom full of an army and ready to achieve political power, but he comes almost in the way of nonviolence, specifically turning down opportunities Jesus had to inaugurate his own kingdom by force. Instead, he dies on a cross on Good Friday, and he's raised from the dead, which, of course, he himself prophesied three times to, to share with the disciples about what his un upcoming crucifixion and resurrection may look like. And in this resurrection, we realize that God cannot be located among the dead, that God is the living God, and God has conquered death on our behalf and for us.
And so we have just celebrated last Sunday, Ascension Sunday, that shows Jesus's continued existence with the Father and the Spirit. And then this week, Pentecost Sunday, the birthday of the church, we celebrate the Spirit being given through the Father and the Son so that you and I might enjoy the presence of God. As we talked last time about the communion that's ours between the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, that the that God would wrap us up, that the triune God would wrap us up in fellowship with God. What an enormous, what an impossible possibility is ours. There are some references here that you can look up that describe the interaction between the prophetic witness, so what happens in the prophets, that the prophets may lead Jesus to, to that the prophets may indicate or may uh, pronounce uh, that Jesus would be for us a certain way, uh, and then look at the references to Colossians and Matthew 14. The prophets somehow were able to foretell uh, Jesus' birth, death, resurrection. And this is the way the gospel writers prepare their case. Now, the significance of the sacrifice of Jesus takes on a really significant role in and for the New Testament. In Romans 3, Jesus is put forth as a, as a sin offering. And in Romans 5, uh, Jesus, that, that the grace of God in Jesus Christ super abounds and so covers sin in an amazing way. And then Romans 8 describes the gift of the Spirit and the life that the Spirit has for those who believe. Hebrews offers a picture of Jesus as the great high priest, taking on an image from the Old Testament where the high priest would make an atonement through the sacrifice of a lamb, Jesus is the great high priest, but he also becomes the sacrificial victim as well. The cross becomes the point of emphasis. It's the fundamental revelation of God as God, right at that, right at that, the objective side, the once and for all unrepeatable, unimaginable place of salvation. Objective means you and I can't control it. We have nothing to do with it. It's not up to us. We can say yes, we can say no, but the, re the, the crucifixion and the resurrection are concrete events in human history. That is, God was working in Christ to overcome all of our no's in order to have the world experience the yes of God's grace and mercy. That's the truth. This is why you can call it a Good Friday. And so that's the objective side. The objective side is one that we cannot change. It doesn't matter what we think of it, that God achieves this in and for and through us. There is the subjective side of God, relationship with God. That is, when we experience God's grace and we understand that that experience transitions us to somehow respond in gratitude. That truly is the only response. Gratitude and faith. Faith and gratitude. That is, we trust in this God who we are so thankful for. Justification by grace through faith. This is a key Reformation teaching that, well, it comes right out of the, it comes right out of scripture. The justification before God, just as if I'd never sinned. And that is an amazing gift that God gives to humanity by virtue of Jesus' self-offering on the cross. And I'd like to stay with that image of sacrifice. Sometimes that image can get turned around so uh, the, per the so that people think that Jesus was doing something either for God, that is, Jesus was dying on, beh on our behalf for God, or for the devil, that, that God was, that the, the, the death of Jesus came in order to ingratiate the devil's desire to carry out a penalty. And I'd like to gently say, that while there are well-intentioned people who, who mean those kinds of things, it's not exactly the way Scripture puts it. The sacrificial image is best. God doesn't kill Jesus. God the Father doesn't require that, but Jesus offers himself as a sacrifice. That is a very, very different image, that God would call Jesus this way and that Jesus would correspond in this way, shows God's justice and God's holiness God's complete otherness, and God's complete love for humanity. For Jesus does something on our behalf that we could not do for ourselves and on our own. That is the full revelation of the love 
and, and grace and the mercy of God and Christ. Now, I just threw a whole bunch at you. These little videos have to be kept uh, small so that you can package them. And I hope that you're jotting down perhaps some questions, even drop them in the comments so that I can answer them as the days go by. So that's going to do it for this session. The, the next session, number four, will be our concluding one for this part of our Exploring Membership. God bless you today.